name implies it is a wall that is covering the anterior part of the abdomen. So it suffices to say that we also have what we call posterior abdominal wall. You get it just like the walls of your classroom here. You have wall on the right side, you have wall on the left side, we have wall on the front side, and then we have wall on the back side. The same thing with abdomen. So you have anterior abdominal wall covering your anterior aspect of the abdomen, and then you have posterior abdominal wall here, and so the two together they overlap to form the lateral abdominal walls. Are you clear? So I'm only concerned with the discussion of the anterior abdominal wall. I'm sure you people must have been told during your introductory aspect of anatomy that there are layers that you are going to come across when you are dissecting human body during your dissection sessions. I'm sure you must have started dissection, didn't you? Good. So similar to any other part of the body, anterior abdominal wall has layers that you are going to meet when you want to cut across the anterior abdominal wall. First and foremost, these layers, we have the skin, which is not different from any other skin in any other part of the body. Although actually, the skin over there is a little bit thinner, you know, as compared to the skin of the scalp and the skin at the back of the neck, you understand. So we have skin and then followed by superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is only fascia that is found in the anterior abdominal wall, so it means that we don't have what we call deep fascia. We don't have deep fascia in the abdomen because deep fascia actually it is a very tough kind of fascia that is trying to plaster you know, the internal organs so that it, 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 if you want to expand you know, your abdomen, if there were to be a deep fascia, the abdomen will not expand. You know, if you see a pregnant woman now, by the time she is pregnant, you will see that the abdomen is protruding like that. So if there is a deep fascia there, the abdomen will not protrude. So also when you eat and get satisfied, your belly will protrude. And if there is deep fascia there, it will not protrude. So you will feel uncomfortable if there were to be deep fascia. So also when you want to do urination, defecation, and what have you, when you want to take in deep breath like this, you see my belly is protruding. So if there is deep fascia, I will not be able to take a deep breath. I will not. Then I will have suffocation. You get my phone. So you see God is wonderful. Very, very much wonderful. And that is why actually in that side, we only have superficial fascia. The superficial fascia there is divided into two layers. There is what we call fatty superficial fascia, and then there is what we call membranous superficial fascia. The fatty superficial fascia is the one that you are going to see that big, big alhajis. Those people in Canton Quarry and other places, when they have billions of nairas and what have you, you see the belly is big like this. And all those who loot our money, sorry if you have a daughter or politician here, you see they have already looted lots of our money there. You see, when they eat satisfied, you see the belly as if they are going to deliver twins or even triplets. It is as a result of fatty layer of membranous fascia. Shall you now kill that person? And then you cut across the anterior abdominal wall, you see a lot of fat. Very large fat like that because they have eaten a lot of oil and everything, a lot of food. So it has become fat. Are you clear? Deep to the fatty layer, you have the membranous layer of the superficial fascia, which is similar to the deep fascia, but as I told you, this membranous layer is not as tough as the deep fascia that we were discussing you know, before. So I told you that there is no deep fascia. Abdomen is not the only place where you are lacking deep fascia. There are other places in the human body where you don't have deep fascia, like in the face. If you want to laugh, if there is deep fascia, you will not be able to open your mouth well. If you want to smile, if there is deep fascia, now, the mouth will not open well. You will start feeling pain because it may likely tear if there is deep fascia. You get my point? And so 
there are many places like that where you, you don't have the deep fascia. So, deep to the superficial fascia, you have layers of muscles, and that is what we call muscular layer of the anterior abdominal wall. And these are the muscles that we are going to discuss from this diagram. We have about uh, five good muscles that combine together to form the anterior abdominal wall muscles. So before you now reach this muscular layer of the anterior abdominal wall, you need to remove the skin. You have to scrape the fatty layer of the superficial fascia, and then you remove the membranous layer before you now reach the muscular layer. Are you clear? So I said we have five good muscles that are forming the anterior abdominal wall. From your lectures of the previous anatomy sessions, I'm sure you are aware that each muscle has an origin and insertion. And the major functions of muscles are what? Movement. But then there are different varieties of movement of a particular muscle. One muscle may only perform one or two movement. Some may perform multiple movements. So we we'll see what are the different categories of movement that this muscle do. You understand? So I'm going to start with the what we call rectus abdominis muscle. This rectus abdominis, from the Latin word rectus, when you hear this word rectus, it means something that is straight. You get it? And so we have this straight muscle here, taking origin from above and gets inserted below. Are you clear? So I'm sure you are aware of what we call a rib cage that is covering our chest. So we have anterior wall of the chest, which is mainly formed by the costal cartilages and the ribs. Are you clear? So this rectus abdominis muscle is bilateral. So all the anterior abdominal wall muscles, there are two. One on the right side, one on the left side. So if we have one rectus abdominis here, we also have another one here. I didn't draw it here because I want to show you uh, the other muscles on this side. Are you clear? So we have this rectus abdominis here taking origin from, you know, in the middle line here in the chest, we have what we call manubrium sternum. You understand we have sternum, we have the manubrium at the top, we have the body of the sternum, and then at the end here we have what you call zygphoid process. You get it? So the rectus abdominis muscle, we said the muscle is straight. So that means all the fibers, they pass downward vertically like that. So they pass in the vertical direction like this, and then they take origin from the zygphoid process, anterior surface of the zygphoid process, and then from the lateral margin of the body of the sternum, as well as from the costal cartilages of the lower aspect, you understand? So the rectus abdominis muscle takes origin from the anterior surface of the zygphoid process, lateral border of the body of the sternum, as well as the lower aspect of the anterior surface of the costal cartilage. Are you clear? So it passes vertically downward and get inserted in. Here, you know, we have two bits and pieces in the middle line, if you can remember your introductory anatomy. So it inserts in the two bits and pieces, and also lateral to the two bits and pieces, you, are, you know that we have what we call pubic tubercle. You get it? And then from there, we have two big, uh, two big crest. So that means this model now inserts, here in the middle line, it inserts on the pubic and pieces, to the pubic tubercle, and to the pubic crest. Are you all clear? That is why I told you anatomy is not Quran. It's understanding, so you better understand what. Here we said originally from the zygophore process, lateral border of the body of the sternum, and from the lower aspect of the costal cartilage. It passes vertically downward and gets inserted in the pubic symphysis, pubic tubercle, and the pubic crest. Are you clear? Yes. Good. This muscle is enclosed by a sheet of, you know, membrane. It's just like you have a cylinder, like a, 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 a tin. You know what is tin? You know, gongoni. So it's just like you have, okay, just like this one. It's just like this marker. If you open this 
you know, bottom of the, because this is the bottom, this is the top. If you open here now, once you open, you will see another cylinder comes out. That is it. So it's like the same song with this, you know, rectus abdominis. It is being enclosed by a sheet of membrane. So imagine that if you remove the bottom of this marker, what is going to come out is the rectus abdominis muscle. And the cover here is the rectus sheath. That means the membrane that surrounds the rectus abdominis is what we call a rectus sheath. It is a membrane, a aponeurosis of the muscles that we are going to discuss that they enclose this rectus sheath. Why? If to prevent the muscles from what we call bowstringing. Do you know what we call bowstringing? If you now try to, uh, maybe, if this are the rectus abdominis here, you know, if you want to take in a deep breath. So if this rectus abdominis muscles were not somehow enclosed inside the rectus sheath, they would just balloon out like that. You get it? So to prevent that ballooning out, the rectus sheath is preventing that bow stringing to balloon out like that. You understand? Because it has been limited by that uh, rectus sheath, which we'll discuss later on. Are you clear the reason why we have the rectus sheath? Good. So this rectus abdominis, we have seen it is origin and insertion and the orientation of the fibers. What you mean by the orientation? That means where they pass, either transversely or vertically or oblique. So we said this one is passing vertically downward. Are you clear? That is the orientation of the muscle fibers of the rectus abdominis. Are you clear? Good. So along the length of the rectus abdominis, there is what we call tendinous intersections. These tendinous intersections can vividly be seen in people who are skinny, somebody who doesn't have fat like myself. When you open, yes, just like Nura, if you remove your captain, should I remove my captain? If I try to contract my anterior abdominal wall muscle, you will see these intersections along the line. You get my point? And that is what we call tendinous intersection. This tendinous intersection, the first one, is at the level of the zygfoid process, where it originates. The second one lies between, you know, halfway between the umbilicus and the zygfoid process. So that means it is in the middle line here, between the umbilicus and the zygfoid process. That is the second tendinous intersection. Are you clear? The third one lies in between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis. Simple and clear. Are you clear? Good. So occasionally you may have four tendinous intersection. It can be placed anywhere, either here or here. Are you clear? Well, mainly we notice three. Somebody may have four. So we now have seen the rectus abdominis and the next muscle that we are going to discuss. I'm going to discuss the movements in general. Are you clear? There is another muscle which is also in relation to the rectus abdominis. That is what we call pyramidalis muscle. We will call it what? Pyramidalis muscle. This pyramidalis is just like a pyramid. You know, pyramid is just like a triangle like this. So this pyramidalis muscle, it has its own base along the insertion of the rectus abdominis. That means it must have originated from where? Pubic symphysis, pubic tubercle, and pubic crest. So it passes up what? And inserts on the anterior surface of the rectus abdominis. This pyramidalis muscle in some of the individuals may be absent. So that means if I dissect any one of you, whether dead or alive, I may not likely see this pyramidalis. So it means that someone, maybe Nora may have it, maybe Dr. Megari may not have it, maybe Anas may also have it. Are you clear? Aha. Uh -huh. So the pyramidalis is attached on the antero inferior aspect of the rectus abdominis. Did you hear the word clearly? Antero inferior. That means it lies anterior and inferior. So we said it lies anterior inferior to the rectus abdominis. And we said that it may likely be absent in some of us, similar to one muscle in the forearm. I'm sure you people must have reminded. What is, remember, what is the name of that muscle? 
Eh? Eh? No, 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 no. Hmm? No, 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 no. I said, eh? Palmaris what? Yes, Palmaris Bravis. You know we have Palmaris Longus in the forearm. We also have, we have Palmaris Bravis. So that one may also be absent. Similar to the Pyramidalis. You see, all these are part of the MCQ questions. And that is why you see me giving you time to put it into memory. So that you don't come and tell me that others have not told you this in class. So now we've seen two muscles, so remaining three muscles. The remaining three muscles are what we call external oblique muscle, internal oblique muscle, which is this one, and then there's what we call transversalis, transversus abdominis muscles. So we have three muscles apart from these two we have already made mention. So let us take external oblique muscle first. The external oblique muscle, you know, takes origin from the lower eight ribs. You know, we have how many ribs? Twelve. When you count one, two, three, four, above the remaining eight, that is where this external oblique muscle now takes origin. So it passes downward and medially. So the fibers, they pass from the lower eight ribs and then passes downward and medially towards the midline. Are you getting me? As these muscle fibers come down, approaching towards the midline, they tend to become tendinous. You know what is tendon, right? Yes. So the muscle fibers now change into a flat tendon, what we call aponeurosis. You know, muscles, they get a tendon at the end, you know, where they insert. Some of the tendons are round, just like uh, this marker. You get it? And some are flattened. So when a tendon is flattened, that is what we call aponeurosis. So these muscle fibers of the external oblique muscles, as they originate from the lower eight ribs, they now pass downward and medially, and towards the middle line, they now change into a flattened tendon known as aponeurosis. So that is the external oblique muscle. So we said it originated from the lower eight ribs, and then as it comes down also, the lower fibers of it also take origin from the iliac crest. If you now put your palm like this along your waist, above here you are going to fit one very curved bone like that. That is what we call iliac crest. So the muscle also takes origin from the iliac crest and also from the anterior superior iliac spine. And so it now passes towards the midline and gets inserted through the aponeurosis into the midline. So that means the external oblique muscle aponeurosis, as it approaches towards the midline, it now inserts into the midline through its own aponeurosis. That means external oblique muscle inserts in the midline through its own aponeurosis. We will see how when we want to discuss the rectus sheath. Are you clear? So the lower aspect of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen. Please, off your handsets. I told you that long ago. So the lower fibers of the external oblique muscles tends to roll in. You know, it's like, when we say rolling in, that means if this is the lower edge like this, so it, it rolls like that. From here, it rolls down like that. So that means it rolls inward like that to form what you call ilioinguinal ligament. So we have ilioinguinal ligament coming as a result of the uh, aphoneurosis of the uh, of the of the of the of the of the external oblique muscle there. So now we've seen that the ilioinguinal ligament is mainly formed from the roll in fibers of the external oblique muscle. 